Welcome, everybody. Happy New Year. New Year, New Year. Yes, 2021 with Season 2 of Real Talk Bluegrass. I'm Shelly, your host, and I'm looking forward to uh, welcoming the amazing, wonderful family band, Echo Valley. Seven, uh, seven family members, six girls, one boy, and here we are to get real with Echo Valley from uh, Pennsylvania. So let's welcome them in. They have... Uh, been definitely keeping themselves busy through quarantine how are you guys we're good how are you good good well it's been a while i mean it's been officially over a year since i've seen all of you um of course last time i saw you was 2019 ibma and just unreal about that huh yeah yeah yeah, I think the last time I saw you, we got a picture with you holding your your DJ award. <laughs> yes, pro most likely, I'm sure it is. Yeah, I mean, of course, that was a phenomenal year for everybody. That wasn't your first time at IBMA. That was your uh, second year um, attending the um, International Bluegrass Music Association's World of Bluegrass. Um, but before we kind of talk about those experiences, Tell us a little bit about each of you guys, because there's some folks that, you know, are seeing you guys for the first time and many probably seen you for a hundredth time. So Liz, let's start with you. Okay. Well, I'm Lizzie and I'm the oldest of the band and I play guitar and sing. I sing. <laughs> we all sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I do a lot of the sort of behind the scenes camera work, though a lot of these girls are starting to take over now. I've been teaching them this over the year. And I'm Emily. I'm the second oldest of the band and I play fiddle and sing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Isabel. I play the mandolin and sometimes the fiddle. I'm Olivia. I play the banjo and the fiddle and every once in a while the bass and I sing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Emmeline and I play the bass mainly and I play a little bit of guitar and mandolin. I'm Anna Mae and I play mandolin. Sing. That's it. <laughs> um, I'm David and I play banjo and I sing. <laughs> well, oh my gosh, I gotta admit, David, you definitely have grown up since uh, I first first met y'all back in 2018 when you guys came to the station. And you didn't say much now then, but you have been saying a lot since then. But now your voice is definitely taking a a different tone out there. Yeah, yes. <laughs> His voice broke over quarantine. <laughs> of course, 2020, um, definitely not a year what everybody was expecting. And I know you guys had a lot of great things lined up um, coming out of 2019, of course, um, being at IBMA. Tell us a little bit about like things that you guys were involved in going into 2019, uh, World of Bluegrass, because you guys were doing a lot of things. You played some shows. But then you guys kind of started working towards getting in with um, the Little House workshop, working with songwriters, uh, Jerry Sally, Donna Lucy, and Rick Stanley. Of course, Jerry and Donna taking home um, IBMA Songwriter of the Year awards. Um, tell us a little bit about that, Lizzie, because I, I know that's very important to how you guys kind of dove right into 2020 and how it's all outcome came. Yeah. So... Back at IBMA 2018, we got connected with Donna Lissy, and my dad met her at one of the workshops there, and um, then he introduced us, and we sang for a little bit, and she said, hey, why don't you guys try some songwriting? I actually do this little house workshop with Jerry Sally, and we thought, oh, that sounds kind of cool. So we did it in spring of 2019. We It was a weekend, and it was great learning experience the first day we were so stressed out and the second day compared to the first was like a breeze like we it was like the first day was like trying to get all the kinks out and the second day we got all these lovely songs and yeah it was great food great fun and learned a lot and we kind of you know got to know donna a little bit and um later on because of that workshop we actually ended up working with her as a producer on our upcoming album so that's pretty yeah that's pretty cool you guys have been a fan favorite. Um, I've had a lot of folks kind of, um, you know, asking me when you guys are going to be on Real Talk. So um, that's got to be encouraging because being a new band, three albums already under your belt, of course, um, 
at your self-titled Upper Valley in 2016, 29, uh, 2018, Rise and Shine. That's really when I got to meet you all. And then, of course, the uh, Christmas with Echo Valley, also in 2018, which is a, a nice rendition to celebrate the season with the family that's you know, and the harmonies that you all have. Just spectacular. And so when you when you guys decided to do the little workshop with Donna, Rick, and Jerry, obviously your mindset was what? I mean, truly, I mean, probably like stoked that you're working with these songwriters, but what really what are you guys driving towards? Were you driving towards getting songs immediately out of that or just learning how to craft songs and write songs and write the melody as well as the lyrics? We were really hoping like we'd instantly know how to write a song, but and that didn't happen. <laughs> but we got some really awesome songs out of it. Yeah, we did. We um, learned a lot. We knew nothing before that. We knew nothing going into it. We were just like, you know, these these are great songwriters. Let's let's go. We hadn't really written a song before. Not really. <laughs> we yeah. tried, but we tried, but they all were like, we just keep those at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, you know, that's a great place to start learning and kind of crafting a, another part of yourselves um, to come into form and into play as a, a musician um, is knowing how to write songs, whether you end up continuously writing them for yourselves or just simply knowing then an aspects of looking for the right song for you. Right. That's right for Echo Valley, because that I think that is a key important thing um, as you go forward with recording new music, you want to be able to, um, you know, find those particular songs that fit you, whether you write them or not. Uh, but, you know, as folks are tu tuning in, we got to give some big shout outs. We got folks from California um, tuning in here right now on Real Talk, Rick, and as well as we have Joan out there, Brian, of course, um, and the family, and also from Pennsylvania. We got Sandy, Sandra out in uh, Cal uh, Can Canada, uh, tuning in. We appreciate everybody um, joining us. But so as we, uh, you know, talk a little bit about the uh, the adventures that you guys have already taken in this short span. I mean, you guys have been playing since 29, 2009. Um, but <laughs> your age, you're, you guys are, you're young, you know. I mean, David, I know just turned 12. Um, and that, how did you guys, you know, when you guys started off this Side, this is the music that you want to play. This is what you want to play. Bluegrass and bluegrass gospel. How did you guys decide that as a family? Uh, it, <laughs> it really just kind of happened because we grew up listening to the Oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack um, and we loved it. And I started playing the fiddle. Lizzie picked up the guitar and just, it kind of built from there. And then we just kind of found our own style of bluegrass. and. It just keeps growing from there, really. So Joe and Diane are asking, they want to know what, um, if you guys have five, what are your top five songs that you love to play? Whether it's your own or maybe it's someone else's that you love to play. Um, go go ahead and answer that for me, Lizzie. Oh, Only no. five? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, my prayer, my prayer written by Donna Ellisi, um, Wildest Dreams. Wildest Dreams, written by Donnie <laughs> Lussie. <laughs> preacher. <laughs> oh, we're gonna find a preacher, written by Donnie Lussie. <laughs> Singing the blues. Singing the blues, not written by Donnie Lussie. <laughs> yeah. um, How many was that? That's, that's four, that's four, one more, one more. Uh, <laughs> to my soul. Oh, To My Soul I Do, written by Donnie Lussie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, huge Donnie Lussie fans. <laughs> <laughs> On that aspect, how does that feel been working with her? Because you guys been in the studio working with her on this new next new album, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's um we're all done recording now and it's in the mixing process. But yeah, it was a really fun experience. I mean, we started recording in December, December, December of twenty nineteen. And then we got a little bit done during Spigma. Mm hmm we went down a couple days early, so it was February 2020. And then after that, you know, we had this long drought of a lot of Zoom calls, and we were able to make it down in July. Um, you know, because of technical stuff, COVID, et cetera, we ended up recording the first part of the CD with Chris Latham. Oh, hey, that's cool. It's in the photo there. Yeah, we ended up recording the first half with Chris Latham, 
And then the second half of the CD, we ended up recording with Rebecca Long. And um, she has a nice studio that she just put in to her house there. And so that was really fun. We actually stayed at her house during that time and recorded. So it was fun to like, you know, you wake up, you walk out the door and you walk like two feet into the studio and you're ready to go. Yeah. So that was kind of fun. But, yeah. And Chris Latham was also mixing the entire thing. So. Yes. Yep. Awesome. Now, 2020, you guys went out to uh, Spigma. That was it. Was that your first time at Spigma and participating in the band competition? No, we did it the year before as well in 2018. Yes. Yes. yes? No. no 19. 19. <laughs> what year is it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> How is how, 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 how was your experience um, when you guys went to Spigma? Of course, this year Spigma not taking place due to the COVID and the pandemic. Um, but um, what uh, what has been your feel about you know getting in a chance to be there, doing the jamming, playing on that stage, competing in a band competition? I know each of you, most of you, have done individual competitions, and we'll, we'll talk about that here in a bit. But as a full family band competing, how was that for you and Emily I want you to kind of kick that one off for me it was it was definitely a learning experience the first year um and so we kind of took what we learned from that and went to the next year and we were so nervous um <laughs> to going into it but it, it was a lot of fun it was good to work together figure things out and all the practice and the hard work that went beforehand to make it happen for us so how was it? Um, obviously, you met some of your heroes, some of the folks that you guys looked up to um, at Spigma, because some folks, you know, the difference between Spigma and IBMA, not everybody goes to each. So and they both have their own different kind of um, artists and fans that kind of attend each of those. How have they how has each of those differed for you to enjoy um, in each aspects that you're looking for to come out of that? Uh, Isabella? How are they different? Yeah. I think they kind of have, they have similar goals when we go to them, but they also have very different, mostly I think because for Spigma we went for the band competition and Ivy May is just such a different feel. There's so many more people, but Spigma is nice because it's, there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one with people because it's smaller and smaller circle of people. You see them over and over, so yeah. you get to know them. <laughs> yeah. And then in Ivy May, you could see someone one day and then you never see them again, even though they're in the exact same place as you. Just it's because just so, it's so, it's so much going on. Massive. But right, right. So uh, you guys, um, of course, the pandemic hit us not too long after um, Spigma of 2020 and, and that you had a lot of shows on the books. I mean, I know you guys were pretty much going to be going to places that you've never played before. What has happened to those shows for you guys, have they been able to, you know, obviously postpone them and hopefully you'll be able to either attend them this year if they're putting them on or how is that working out for you guys as a as a performing artist? How is that affecting you guys, Lizzie? Yeah, a lot of that is um, it's still up in the air. We're starting to like do some email correspondence with a lot of folks now. You know, everybody's kind of like sticking their head out of the water, just like, what's what are we going to do this year? Most of our shows got kicked over to this year, like provided everything is okay. Right. So we're hoping all of them will come back. Right now I have one, at, one for sure I could put in the calendar and that's in um, June. It's in the middle of um, Pennsylvania. I'll have to go back and look up the town. I don't quite remember off the top of my head, but um, we're going to be doing our Oh Brother show out there. Um, we did this last year at the Rex Theater in Pittsburgh. It's, um, us, Echo Valley, as well as the Jacobs Ferry Stragglers, Wellstrung, and the Millbillies, all four of us bands, do the whole entire soundtrack of Oh Brother Right Thou from beginning to end. And each band gets their own song. A couple songs are, you know, that we mix up the band members a little bit. And we get to do that this June. And I'm so excited because that show is so much fun. We well, and <laughs> it's the 20th anniversary of Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, the movie and the tracks. I mean, so it's going to be a huge event. So I, I hope, you know, it, it, it's an outdoor uh, event. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, completely. That like a, a big field. Sure that's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Most likely, you know, as long as all the everything works out. I mean, we know the drill at this point. Like, you know, Lord willing, Lord willing it's going to happen. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Well, of course, you know, with the pandemic that hit, it came, I know how much um, you guys have been really at the forefront of making sure you guys are, you're, you're making sure you guys are out there in front, making sure people know who Echo Valley is, because it, it was pretty much, you were getting out there and then all of a sudden, whoop, pull back, you know, and not because you had to, because the world had to. How how have you guys embraced this pandemic for you guys as individuals as well as a band in marketing yourselves to keep people familiar with Echo Valley and each of you guys and what you do as an artist individually? We're going to start with Olivia on this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, it's certainly there's more time to practice individually now. <laughs> I did a lot of that this year compared to the other years. Um, it's been a good experience because we've had to do the live streams and that was just completely different from being with a crowd right in front of you. So we had to learn new things for that. We had to a script that none of us seemed to be able to memorize. <laughs> But that was good because it helped us all know what to say for next time we're in front of an audience, not just Elizabeth talking. So that's good. <laughs> so uh, in anime, I want to ask you because, you know, when I when I saw you guys in the studio with me here, you know, you're just kind of getting familiar playing regularly on the mandolin. And I got to say, I'm going to see you've probably grown more. At least that's what I'm seeing from the live um, streams that you guys do do. I mean, it's remarkable. How have you um, dedicated yourself into perfecting as much as you can right now at a young age for the mandolin? Well, I've been learning a lot of Isabel's parts and mm -hmm. trying to learn other instruments. So it's getting there. <laughs> Yeah, she's really come along on the mandolin this whole year. In fact, this morning, um, the mandolin teacher was over, and they were playing together. The mandolin teacher had a guitar, and anime was playing, but me and Mom were in the other room, so we couldn't see what was going on. And Mom looks at me, she goes, is that is that Bernie playing? I said, no, that's anime. She goes, what? We, we were, it was so funny, because she's come so far so quickly. She sounds amazing. Well, and then I have to say that the same thing with David, um, him and the banjo. You know, um, and not very many bands have two banjo players. How is that going, um, you know, as you're growing <laughs> more as a banjo player, David? Um, you know, how is that, you know, embracing the stage with two banjos? I mean, that's a rarity in bluegrass. Sometimes, not all the time. For some songs, it's hard because, I mean, you can't always have, like, both people doing roles at the same time. So, it, like, it, time and time again, like, it sort of gets messed up, but I mean, we do it with a lot of practice. I mean, we have to sit down together and practice like for like an hour or two. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, you know, as you know, you look at, you know, I want to, I don't want to say you guys are like the three forefront of the band, but Lizzie, Emily, and is um, uh, Isabel. I mean, you guys are pretty much the strong strong in your instruments because you've competed in competitions. Um, I know Lizzie, you've assisted um, with your sisters in their competitions and you guys taken home some amazing, great championships um, in that. How do you keep growing, you know, during a pandemic when competitions aren't happening? We'll go with uh, Emily first. Um, I think the live streams really helped us because we can't, we're not playing for different audiences every show. So you can't repeat the same things. Mm -hmm. So you would have to really practice really hard to get these songs really tight and good. And so that extra practice time really grew our skills and song challenge. So yeah, we would do a song challenge every week where we pick a fan, a, a fans would put comments in and we put them in a hat, pick it out. And so it'd be a brand new song we had never touched before. And so that was actually one of the biggest things for us. Um, and growing our skills and, and learning how to keep it together and sounding good. Right. Well, one of the other key things that I, you know, obviously everybody, when they see Echo Valley's name on a, a flyer, a festival flyer, or, you know, on a tour schedule and that they know they're getting a show 
with style. You guys have a particular style. And and Rick from California, it, I love this question because I was getting to this round this question anyways, because of the fact that you guys dress in costumes, you, you dress up for the stage. And I think, you know, um, that is one of the key things when you're performing, people are not just there to hear you sing. They want to see, see a full show. Um, and they know they're seeing multiple people, but you want to also stand out. So Rick, his question is, is this, when you're on the road, um, obviously you guys, I know you guys travel in a van and that, um, so who takes the longest to get ready for a show and who is the quickest? Well, I'd say shortest is definitely David. Cause I mean, right. he doesn't have like hair to brush and makeup to put on. Yeah. That's um, not fair. <laughs> <laughs> longest is Probably Elizabeth, for yeah. sure. <laughs> for sure. And why is that? Stop it. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and of course, the other question he had, and you know, we all know we love food. You guys have a beautiful farm. You guys raise your animals um, and that. But when you're on the road, where do you stop to eat? What do you guys do for food when you guys are out on the road? Are you packing <laughs> or are you stopping? We eat out of a cooler. Yeah. <laughs> we make um, sandwiches and things like that. Mama is really good um, with having good variety of food for us while we're on the road. Because otherwise, if we stop for every meal, <laughs> that gets a little bit expensive for this many people. So yeah, we definitely, yeah. Mom's good at that. Once a year, we'll stop at Cracker Barrel. Special occasions. Yeah. yeah. After, <laughs> you know, after you've done a big show, you've prepped for months on it. And we'll stop at Cracker Barrel on the way home, and it'll be so nice and relaxing because it's like, oh, real, like not real food, but you know, like, <laughs> like a full Hot meal. Man. You're not just snacking on the go. You know, you're like, mom, do you have anything I can grab really quick? Pretzels again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and chicken salad. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to go back a couple years, 2018. You guys were in the WOBL studios in, in the studios with me. We had a lot of great fun, but then we adventured out later on that day. And I, I, I cannot not talk about it. I mean, Lou, uh, the, the uh, Rizzi's corn maze, that was a day that we just had so much fun. Got lost a few times in the maze, the corn yeah. maze. But, I mean, what you know, when you guys get a chance to do something like that, it, is it things like that that you guys like doing when you're not on the road? And or do you like doing that and making a stop to do something like that on the road when you, you get a chance to have some extra fun? We do it on the road, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. we I mean, we like we like both. But honestly, if we're going to do something fun, it's usually while well, we're already out. So we don't have to make like you know, an extra trip out. But I'm glad you brought up the corn maze thing. So I was thinking about that last night. And I remember you live streaming us being lost in the corn maze. <laughs> she like, got us lost. <laughs> yeah, we won't say Lizzie got us lost, but she did, didn't she? She did. <laughs> we're, we're just going to blame the old one. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. We're just going to do that. Hey, at least you didn't get stuck on a slide going down. <laughs> yeah, who, who was holding the map? It wasn't me. <laughs> Idea. <laughs> well, uh, you guys had had the opportunity to um, do a show this year, and actually in front of fans, and that what took place just in Columbus, Ohio, um, at the Sterling G uh, Bluegrass Jamboree. How was that? How how was the the interaction with the fans um, and the guidelines that you guys had to follow? It was a little strange looking out and just seeing everyone, you know, wearing masks. You can't see whether their expressions, whether they liked it or not. They clapped. Though. And they they, they clapped. They were cheering. Yeah. Muffled, but cheering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was really nice. It's it's so good to get out again. And every time you go out and play now, it's, you know, it's a little, it's, it has a little bit more. It's that much more special because we didn't have it for so long. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it was. I mean, I know it's not that far into the year, but it was one of the highlights of my entire <laughs> year, <laughs> including 2020. <laughs> so, uh, Joe and Diane want to know um, what, as fans, what can fans do to help you guys out in your career, especially during a pandemic, and and that what is something you guys are hoping 
to capture with the fans that follow you on Facebook, Instagram, as well as um, through your website at echovalleybluegrass.com. Yeah, we'd love for you guys to be sharing our stuff. That really gets the word out. And if you guys like our social media pages, that's always lovely because the more people that like things, the more like Facebook and Instagram, the more they push those things out. So we get a little bit more exposure, a little bit more people find out about us. And yeah, if you guys leave comments and stuff, it really makes our day because, you know, we can't see you really much anymore. So when we get those comments, we we read them out loud to we each do. other. <laughs> we'll go and we'll find each other like, hey, Libby, did you see the comment? And we'll read it. So it makes us feel really special. You also can find them. Um, you can buy our CDs on our store. It's echovalleybluegrass.com slash store. We have all three of our albums out on there as well as signed posters and an Echo Valley sticker. Eventually, we hope to get some other fun things on there, hopefully with the release of our CD. So just keep up and keep watching for that. So, yeah. Well, I definitely know I've been seeing uh, folks uh, um, wearing the T-shirts uh, uh, throughout social media during different events and stuff. Now, with um, with the pandemic that happened, of course, you guys been doing the, the live streams. Lizzie, tell us a little bit about, because, you know, my thing is a lot of folks you know, love watching them, but I don't, sometimes I wonder if they know what goes into making these happen. And I know you guys do something unique and I, I know you're not the only ones that do this, but tell us a little bit about, you know, preparing a day, preparing the music, obviously, and putting these shows together because they're just remarkable. And I know a lot of folks uh, tune in when you guys do do this, but can you kind of go through the steps so folks can understand and, and I think once they understand that, I think not only will they appreciate you when you are out live on the stage in festivals, but the appreciation that you guys do do right now um, to make these streams happen. Yeah, so what we do first when we're planning for a live stream is I go, I get a notebook and I make an outline of what songs we want to do. And then I show it to the girls, make sure everyone likes what we have going on. And then we go and we make a script and it just, we're not that great ad libbers, so we need a script. So we go and we write in, you know, where are we putting our jokes? Where are we going to, you know, talk about the website? So we have about, you know, four to six pages of that and we practice it for, you know, a week up to a month, depending on, you know, how we can work out scheduling with when we do the live stream. And then we pre-record everything on a Thursday. And we make sure to do everything in one take. So, um, well, mostly one take. It's usually we do it in like three chunks. Um, that gives us a chance to, if anyone needs to adjust anything, retune, a string breaks, you know, there's opportunity for that. But those three chunks are all live to give the feeling of a live show. So if there's a mistake, you know, we just keep rolling. You keep going with it. You know, if someone, you know, makes an unexpected joke, it's, it's in there. It's all, all. <laughs> All live, just it's pre recorded live, but it's live. And uh -huh. so we did it on Fridays. And then Saturday morning, I usually get up and I drive to the nearby McDonald's and I sit in the parking lot and connect to the internet there and I upload it and I have it set for we have a program that goes and puts it on, schedules the live stream. And so seven o'clock on that particular Saturday, it goes live on Facebook and YouTube. So who uh, who jokes or who comes up with the jokes and the, the skits that you guys do do in the show? We all do. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a group effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look what joke I found. Ooh, that's terrible. <laughs> we gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you guys have, have added um, some fun things to the shows as well to kind of break up the music and and that. What gave you guys the idea to do? those skits um, during the, 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 the live streams that you guys have been doing? Yeah. Emily? Yeah, Hee Haw. Hee Haw was the big inspiration there. That and we were just, we were bored out of our minds and wanted to do something. Anything that just wasn't what we had been doing. So yeah, we did the Hee Haw skit and we actually got inspired. Once we got our whole pre-recorded thing figured out, we found out that we could have special guests on our little hee haw skits. So you know the song, Where Oh Where Are You Tonight? For the folks out there who haven't seen our live streams, um, we would have a special guest on, and we did that for s several of our live streams. Maybe about 15 of them have special guests. We had Price Sisters, 
We had Becky Buller. Yeah. We had Darren and Brooke, Darren and Brooke Aldridge. Aldridge. The Cody Ray Norris Stevenson. show. Sorry. <laughs> the Cody Norris show. And Larry Stevenson. Larry Stevenson. Yeah. Lots and lots. Of yeah, lots of lots of folks. It was it was a blast. It was so much fun. So it was the, like, um, <laughs> Right. So Annie's asking a question for Emmeline. <laughs> yes. Um, you always look like you're really enjoying playing the double bass and you have a sense of comedy about you. Um, do you find it real fun? Real? Are you really having fun when you're playing that bass? Oh, yeah. Lots of fun. <laughs> it's, it's like I kind of just like make it up a lot of the times. And they don't know what I'm doing a lot of the time. <laughs> we never do. And so a lot of times when I'm laughing, it's because they look at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. She has this smile we call the bass smile. And so she's up there. And then, you know, she did something she really likes. So she'll go like, like that. So we call it her bass smile. <laughs> Now, when when you guys uh, like particularly uh, Emmeline, this is this is this is an interesting piece because a lot of folks when they decide on an instrument, I mean, you're you're a family. There's seven of you. How did you guys decide the instrument that you guys are you know predominantly playing? So I mean, like the bass. Why did you? What gravitated you to the bass? Well, they needed a bass player, <laughs> <laughs> and. So we um, hired you. Yes, yeah, she was hired. <laughs> she used to stand on a stool to play bass. The first couple of years, she was so small that we had to get like a milk crate or a stool for her to stand on so she could reach. <laughs> now, now, obviously, David, I mean, you're the sole gentleman of the band. You know, was, I mean, we, they had a, ba a banjo player, but what made you decide, you know, I want to play the banjo, not the dobro, not the guitar. I want to be the banjo man. Well, I always really wanted to play the banjo before we ever had a banjo player. And I always thought it was really cool. And so I was like, I'm going to learn the banjo. And Lily started it. And I was like, eh, oh, well. <laughs> so I played it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Olivia, when did you start playing the banjo? Um... A little over two years ago. Really? It took me a while to get into it, but. <laughs> what was your, your predominant known instrument before the banjo? Uh, the, the, the fiddle. I, we do trio fiddles. And I, I mostly just sang, though. But now I have something to do on stage. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> And uh, Isabel, how about you? I mean, you know, you're predominantly known as the mandolinist of the group, um, and and that, um, and the, you know, how did you get involved with uh, all that you do? Um, I think the biggest reason is when I was really young, we had a mandolin that was blue, and I thought it was so pretty, and I wanted to learn to play it so bad. <laughs> Now, since then, we have since gotten rid of the blue mandolin, but that was, <laughs> this. That was the source of my inspiration. It was blue. I think right there is a song, a blue mandolin song. That's what you need to, you yeah, guys got to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and of course, you know, we have the uh, wonderful, lovely uh, anime also playing the, uh, the, the mandolin and that um, what obviously gravitated you to the mandolin as a young, aspiring artist. Well, I don't know what made me go to the mandolin. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. good. I mean, we already well, had it. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Emily, you you know you're one of the ones who have uh, um, competed in fiddle competitions and been a Maryland State Fiddle Contest uh, champ, grand champ. Uh, obviously, you've been playing the fiddle for some time. Uh, what gravitated you? To the fiddle, because none of these instruments are easy to play. That is for sure. It takes time and practice. But, you know, to be a grand champ, um, it, it's got to be a remarkable feel for what you do. Yeah, I, I actually started when I was four. And I, I started on the classical um, violin. And when I was, I think I was 10, I went to a, a fiddle contest just to listen. I happened to be passing by with my family. And I looked at my dad and I said, I want to do that. And I think it was maybe, I think it was the next year, 
I competed in my first one and I was so nervous and that's kind of your pinky. Yeah, I no. Yeah, I broke my pinky finger um <laughs> two days before, but I still was able to go. And <laughs> made, a, um, made a splint out of a popsicle stick. Yeah. <laughs> and ever since then the fiddle just really stuck. I, I love the fiddle so much and it's it's just so much fun to play. Right. Now, of course, Lizzie, we left you as the late bloomer of asking this because we do multiple things. Um, and your main instrument is the guitar and vocals as well as Emily is vocally as well. But um, what got you into playing the uh, guitar out of all these instruments? Why the guitar? Well, it was a good accompaniment instrument. Emily already played violin at the time and we, need some, we needed something to fill in. And I dabbled in flute for a little bit, but just flute and violin with nothing to like support it. I don't know, I didn't like that. So I did guitar. My mom knew a little bit of guitar. And so I'd watch her a little bit. And then we had a, I had a teacher for a couple of years. And yeah, my dad played it. And yeah, I don't know. It was just one of those things like it's there. It sounds good, might as well. You know, it wasn't like a ton of thought like, oh, I love this. I should really play this. It was just like, oh, cool, guitar. You know, and then it kind of slowly grew. Well, and how long, Steve wants to know how long it would typically um, take you guys to learn a new song when you guys grab a new song that you guys want to put into your shows? Mm -hmm. um, we've done we, it in as little as a week before, but even less, even less than that, um, where we realized, oh no, we need this kind of song for the show. But t typically, our best is when we have two solid weeks of practicing it working out all of the kinks in it, figuring every detail out, and then we perform it for people. That's another thing. Before COVID, it took us a good month to learn a new song. So the live streams, the live streams they made us have to learn new songs faster. So mm -hmm. yeah, we've done a lot better with that. <laughs> now within okay so we know there's band competitions out there and i you know i know there's been some virtually but not very many virtually competitions in that um but within the family do you guys ever like have like a banjo off or fiddle off or a mandolin off do you guys like you know have a nice you know fun feel competition of who's gonna do something spectacular on each of those instruments or did I just put a bug in your ear to make you guys do it now <laughs> it's mostly between the two banjos yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the two banjos they all the time constantly theme time all day yeah, it never starts out as a competition but then it starts getting louder and louder and faster and faster <laughs> that's not how it goes David well yes it is this is how it goes oh <laughs> <laughs> now, I just thought, I, I see that we have another question from Emily, for Emily. Um, are you a guitar player as well? Earl's asking. Yeah, I, I play in a few songs in the band, but not very many. I typically do um, flat picking, mostly. Oh, fun, fun story about Emily and her guitar playing. So, a couple of years ago, we entered a contest, we did... Um, a guitar contest and we both played I played my bit and she accompanied me and then we swapped and I go and I, I get third place and I was so excited I'm like I got third place this is great and then Emmeline goes and wins <laughs> <laughs> so obviously so very good. Good. earlier a lot of folks you know when they see Echo Valley's name on a festival flyer or on a schedule they know what they're getting and they know that they're getting that show that's that style that look um was this something that you guys discussed about to kind of brand yourself with the look that you have um with the old old style look like i mean you guys when you do your um a lot of your harmonize it reminds me of the andrew sisters um and that and the style kind of comes from that era was that something that was embraced um, individually and you guys were like, oh, let's do this? Or was this a suggestion from fans or your parents? It was a little bit of a lot of things. Um, as far as the sound goes, like the Andrew Sisters sound, um, not all of our songs are Andrew Sisters sound, but we all like that stuff. We all like have it in our playlists on Spotify. Um, mm -hmm. we, we really try to play like what we like so it comes across on stage that we like it. 
So if we want to do a little bit more of a bluesy thing, we do, but we always make sure to bring it back into the main brand. But as far as the look goes, the look started when we did the Oh Brother Where Art Thou show at the Rex Theater in Pittsburgh. What was it, two years ago, 2019? Yeah. Yes, 2019, mm -hmm. almost two years ago. And we were told, hey, can you guys dress up like you're from the Oh Brother Where Art Thou movie? And we're like, oh, sure, we can do that. We like to sew. And so we put together some outfits and some fun shoes and hats and makeup and stuff. And after that show, we posted the photos on Facebook. And we started getting messages from friends and family and fans. Everyone was like, oh, my goodness, I love that. I can't believe it. That looks great on you guys. And we're like, really? I don't know. I had no idea. And um, so we thought, oh, well, should we kind of try to play to that? So we did a couple shows after that with our, you know, our old fashioned dresses, I guess you could call them. And yeah, and it just took off. Everyone loved it. So for IBMA of 2019, we decided the whole entire week we're going to just wear our dresses. And so we sewed for like three months straight trying to get all those dresses done. And everyone loved it. We had three different sets. Yeah, three sets so we could always be six. They three. can't be dried in the dryer because they're homemade. We don't want anything to shrink or go wonky on us. So we'd be wearing one set. One set would be in the wash and, and hang drying. And then the other one the other be one ready be for the next day. Ready, ready to day. be ironed. Yeah, ready to be ironed. <laughs> it's like two hours of ironing. <laughs> okay, so um, Steve is asking another question. He wants to know, um, has any one of you ever tried playing the Dobro? No. We want to. Really I've touched the Dobro twice. I don't know about these guys. Twice. Twice. <laughs> twice. Yeah. We don't have okay. one yet. Yeah. Emily, there's yeah. a question that just popped up um, for from Peter for you. Um, are you influenced by the Klez Klezmer music? If Sammy could pop that back up so you can read it to make sure I'm saying this right. I'm not, um, you know, <laughs> influenced in any of this. Um, I actually have never heard of that, but now I'm very interested in that. I have yeah, to look that to up. Google it. Yeah. Huh. All right. Sammy, yeah, no. they, Thanks, Peter. Now she's got homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can learn something new now. <laughs> now, and this is, and this is another good question. Um, obviously, like, I, I will admit, sometimes before I go on the air, especially doing real talk, <laughs> I get a little nervous, even though I've been doing radio for over 25 years. I do get nervous a little bit. Do you guys get nervous on stage at all? Any single one of you? It depends. Yes. It, 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 yes. Yeah. The short answer, yes. But it's not always a fatal nervousness. It's always good to be a little bit nervous and excited. So you, you know, because you want to be like, oh, I, I hope I play well. I hope I do do my job type of thing. But um, yeah, because if you're not really nervous and you're just kind of sitting back and you're not really pushing your music along and trying to bring the energy, then. Eh. But the most nervous was. Uh, the Spigma competitions. Yes. IBMA. Our hands uh, the, shaking. The IBMA showcase. Oh, oh really? Oh, that was, I was more nervous as people were coming in because people like Darren and Brooke came in and we were like, <laughs> <laughs> so we were really nervous for that. <laughs> I, and I actually I was just getting ready to ask you guys about the experiences at uh, World of Bluegrass. 2018 was your uh, first time attending. Um, how was, how was that for you guys to go? Because you guys went as, not as a performing band, performing showcases, you guys went there to get educated and learn a little bit more about the community of bluegrass. What did you, what was your first reaction when you entered the halls in Raleigh, North Carolina? <laughs> Confusion. What do we do? I don't know what I'm doing here. What? <laughs> um, I don't think we knew what we were in for. We'd heard amazing stories about IBMA, which is a big reason why we went. But I don't think any of us were prepared for how amazing our time was. Uh -huh. And it made us that much more excited to go back the next year and see what else we could learn and get new people to meet, different things to do. Yeah. I, I personally was surprised how, like, all the people that I would seen, all the other bluegrass artists I would seen on the internet were just there walking around with the coffee. You know, and you're like, wait, 
Wait, Roger Vincent. Roger Vincent just walked by. What do you? What? Wow. You know, we, what, we uh, for your one. first experience at IBMA 2018, what is something that really stands out to this day that happened to you? Um, as individuals or as a whole, kind of think about that. Um, okay. because I personally, I think I know what it is, but I, I want you guys to share them. So I'm going to go with, uh, Olivia first on this one. Cause she looks like she's ready to, to burst. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I was, we were trying to film a little video on the escalators and I was wearing flip flops. Don't wear flip flops to IBMA. <laughs> Uh, so I, I was going up the escalator that was going down. And this is when I was young and naive, so I won't be doing this again. So I cut my foot, my toe, and oh, I was bleeding everywhere. And we just, someone was, oh, we just met was saying hi to Elizabeth. And I'm like, oh, Lizzie, oh, I think my toe's bleeding. And she's like, oh, and we have band-aids, mom got band-aids. Okay. So me and Isabel, we were going down to the, later, we were going down to the exhibit hall and I was like I don't want to take the escalator I don't want to risk cutting my foot again so I went down the stairs and I like skipped two stairs and I sprained my ankle the <laughs> really foot. bad the other foot I sprained it really bad so I was limping around the whole time with this cut up toe and sprained ankle it was the last day though thankfully but <laughs> that was that really was definitely remember <laughs> I wasn't going to go with that, but that works. Oh. <laughs> I think for all of us, though, as a whole, like our most memorable moment from that first time was we were in the hallways jamming, just having a good time. And Rhonda Vincent walks by and she comes up and she goes, hey, you guys want to play a song? And we're like, oh, yes. <laughs> so we got to play a song with her and it was so much fun. Yeah. That was, that was because our friend Austin Heffelfinger, he was talking with us, and he had um, already had met Rhonda. I think he played, like, guested on a song um, during one of her shows before. So she recognized him, and, yeah, it all just went from there. It was crazy. But, um, the award show. Yes. My, one of my – okay, us three right here. Boop, boop, and boop. Right here. We, um, we got to go to the award show. Um, Michelle, you actually took me as, as your plus one on that. And then Emily and Olivia got um, last minute tickets um, from Joe Mullins, I believe. Mm -hmm. He had two extras at the last minute. So we all got dressed and, and went. And that blew my mind. I don't know about you guys. But oh, yeah. Seeing all those people on that big stage, like it was goosebumps the entire night. I was I was screaming and it was it was great. It was what about the backstage experience, the the red carpet. Obviously, we didn't walk the red carpet in 2018, <laughs> but you got to mingle with Hall of Famers um, in the reception before the awards show. I mean that that I mean that's what I was waiting for you guys to mention. Besides the Ron Vincent part, I didn't know about the the uh, escalator part, but now that's <laughs> yeah. I didn't tell but, too many people. <laughs> But so, you know, you look at that 2018 was a great experience for you guys to kind of get your feet wet and kind of lay the ground for 2019 World of Bluegrass, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, this is where you guys pretty much, you know, said we're here. We're here. We're ready to perform um, and book some gigs um, and get us out there and playing some more. Uh, what did you guys take from, obviously you, you participated in some of the seminars, um, the luncheons, as well as, you know, the after hour showcases. Um, what did you guys take that from 2019 that you were, you know, obviously didn't have the chance to experience from 2018 and, you know, the, the encouragement of folks going year after year. Do you encourage people doing that? Do you think it's it's important, um, no matter if you're an up and coming band or an a, a established band that's been out there for years, to kind of you know be part of it to help others kind of step forward and branch out more? Elizabeth, we're gonna go with you on this one. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, on our part, going you know the second year was you know twice as much fun as the first. It's really fun. Um, for us as artists, getting to see other artists who have done this thing for so long, 
you get to say hi to them and you get to see like you know what cool instrument licks they're doing you get to see just you know their stage presence you sit there and watch you go wow that's such a, like that's such a cool thing you do and it's such a great example and an inspiration for all of us and yeah. and so many people there are willing to talk to you and kind of help you give you advice help you learn and grow mm -hmm. and it's just a really great big community and everybody's really helpful nice. yeah now, of course, I know for myself and other fans and artists that attend Spigma and IBMA World of Bluegrass, like Rick said, it's, it's I be mostly awake. I mean, you're pretty much awake 24 <laughs> 7 when you go to this week long conference and, and participate in everything and everything. Do you feel you, what you put in is what you're getting out when you attend? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. We would not be the band that we are if we didn't, if we hadn't gone both times, hands yeah. down. Because not only, go, go, go ahead, finish. Not, not only is the experience of being there or something, the practice you put in beforehand, because you know a lot of people are going to be there, you know, there's fans coming to see you as well because those evening showcases. And so you're like, I, I have to be on my A game. So we all just practice our butts off. It's, it's intense, but it's it's so worth it because then afterwards you're like, wow, I couldn't play this before, and now it's really easy. So, yeah. So as you guys oh. um, venture into 2021, um, how, what is one thing you guys reflect on what you've learned from 2020 and 2019 to, you know, move forward? I mean, yes, we're still in a pandemic. Restrictions are still in place for festivals as for artists to perform. Um, what are you guys looking forward to accomplishing in 2021? I think we're <laughs> I think we're really excited um, to put all of the work that we've had in the past live streams, learning how to how, we had to learn how to work without people watching us and feeding off their energy. So I'm excited to see how that will grow even more. And I'm really excited to release our album. I'm yes. so excited to do that. <laughs> oh yeah. It's gonna be good, you guys. Mm -hmm. We're so excited. It's 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 very different from our Rise and Shine album, but mm -hmm. not in a bad way because yes. we've we've gotten older, we've gotten better at our instruments, we've gotten better at singing. Donna is a great vocal coach. Folks, Absolutely. just want to put that out there. She's fab. And yeah, the whole CD is just, it's sounding epic. I get goosebumps on it and it's listening to my own voice. So, you know, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, you know, Donna is a big influence um, on all of you and for what you do. Um, and just going back to the top five songs that you guys love to play. Um, but who is um, each of your own? influences it doesn't have to be someone necessarily in bluegrass it could be anyone um that is a huge influence in what you do as an individual we're going to start we're going to go down we're going to start with david and go across and then back uh, up to emily and then over okay Okay, no. does, that, does that work for you? We didn't think this question through. <laughs> <laughs> why don't, why don't oh, we go? Why don't we go with Emily? Then we'll, we'll come back to you. <laughs> that you can think about it. Yeah. Um, right. I think for me personally, a cup. I don't have just one because there's so many amazing people out there. But Donna Ulysses definitely a big one for me. Ooh, and, uh, surprise! Yeah. 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 And yeah. Becky Buller as well. Um, and so I can't even name them all. There's just so many. How about you, Olivia? Uh, Allison Krause. Oh, oh no. my goodness. That's my dream is to go see her in Union Station play. Like, that's like my dream. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Anime? I don't know yet. I'm still trying to figure it out. Okay, as well. Okay. Um, I kind of would have to go with Olivia on Allison Krause and a lot of Celtic people I listen to. What about you, Lani? Um, also Allison Krauss <laughs> and Rhonda Vincent and Becky Buller and also um our music teacher, my guitar teacher. He's been extremely helpful. Yeah. 
and he plays really pretty. His name's Bernie, and he teaches us guitar, banjo, and mandolin. So he he really knows his stuff. He's really yeah. good. Um, I think my inspiration mm -hmm. would probably be um, I out of bluegrass. I really like Josh Groban. I like his <laughs> his stuff. Um, but I don't know Becky Buller, Balsam Range, Donna. You know the works. How about you, David? Did you think of one? Um. Well, Becky Buller. <laughs> um, and our teacher helped us. Help, well, helped me a lot because I hardly knew anything before that, yeah. like YouTube, and I don't know. It didn't do much for me before, but as soon as I started learning from him, it helped me a lot. And <laughs> I have to say, I like any drifters, and I think that's oh, it. Well, Banjo Ben. Oh, Banjo yeah, Ben. His lessons Banjo helped ben, a yeah. lot. Yeah. Have you guys, um, um, Olivia and uh, Dave, have you guys um, ever thought about picking up the claw hammer banjo? Well, I tried once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried once. Uh, hey, that, that is a sort of trying and not trying, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, as, as we get ready to wrap things up um, in that, um, I wanted to ask you guys about the new album a little bit more because this is something like you said you said it's going to be kind of similar to rise and shine but different how 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 can you kind of not spill all the beans but spill the beans a little bit so we can look forward to this album coming out um that you've been working with uh donnie lisi rebecca spears um what can you give us uh what can we give them yeah, I hesitate to tell you guys any of the songs because we don't really have our, you know, the game plan all nailed down yet. So and it's coming. Surprise. Yeah, yeah, we're not good. We're not just gonna release it really, really. But um, <laughs> we're, hoping, we're hoping for some new music videos, though. Yes, yeah, new yeah. music videos are coming. But if you guys want a little taste of what it might sound like, <laughs> you can check out our live streams because that's our current sound is what's in those live and, streams. And, oh, we won't tell you which ones, but a lot of the CD songs are actually peppered throughout the live streams. Yes. Yes. yes our live streams do have some of our songs that are going to be on our album. So are they, leave you are we going to see, are we going to see some original songs on this new album? Yes. Yes. Nice. <laughs> More than one. I will say that. <laughs> well, uh, Rick also wants to know, um, will it be available on vinyl? He's a vinyl guy. He loves listening and spinning the records. Yeah, that depends on the demand. If people start out, like, you know, we start doing all that prep um, for the CD. and We start doing all of the um, marketing for that and putting out Facebook posts. If people start requesting we have enough, we will do it. Um, I know it's kind of expensive to do it unless you get, like, a certain minimum. But um, if we have enough, oh, sure. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And I think something like that and something like making sure you have enough CDs really depends on if live shows are going to happen as well. I think that's a key thing because that I know is a huge income of selling the merchandise right there in front of people who just got done seeing you live, seeing what you guys um, bring to, you know, to the show and then they get to take it home and have it with them, um, forever, you know, and I think that's a key thing, um, to hopefully shows will be back. You guys will be back performing more than one here and there. Um, I know you said the, you guys will be celebrating again in June, July for the Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, um, event. And I mean, you can't, that's going to be a fun time because celebrating 20 years this year with that, uh, so that's going to be spectacular. Hopefully we'll all be alive together again in the fall with IBMA, World of Bluegrass in Raleigh. Um, and, you know, I know you guys are looking forward to something like that again. I know you guys are missing out on this year's Spigma because obviously the pandemic uh, canceled that out. But uh, we hope everybody can be together and see you guys live at the um, International Bluegrass Music Association's World of Bluegrass Week in Raleigh, North Carolina. Speaking on that note, um, it's been a pleasure um, having you guys be with us. I hope you guys had fun. I had fun. We got a little real. I appreciate all the fans that tuned in and asked some questions. It's been a blast. Um, what a great way to kick off season two of Real Talk Bluegrass with this wonderful family uh, from Pennsylvania, Echo Valley. You guys definitely, um, 
proving that you're you have the, the the music the harmony and you continuously do that and you're continuously growing and we appreciate what you guys do want to make sure people check out your streams you want to make sure they go and like the key thing is when you go to a facebook page you don't want to just follow you want to like the page um your facebook page and your instagram is echo valley bluegrass and the website check out echo valley bluegrass dot com and you guys happy new year to you tell your parents hello as well and i look forward to seeing you guys on the road yeah all right yeah thanks for having us on this was really fun yes mm -hmm. it's good to see you again too we've missed you <laughs> we'll get you back in the studio when we're allowed to have guests back in the studio how's that <laughs> But as we get ready to wrap things up here again, thank you to Echo Valley. Thank you for all of you joining us as we got real on Real Talk Bluegrass, episode one of season two. Uh, I can't do this. Um, I can't say I do this all alone. I got to say thank you so much to uh, my wonderful dear friend, uh, Mr. Sammy Passamano, who makes this happen every time we get a chance to do this with uh, Bluegrass Music TV, and as well as Ronnie Reno. We appreciate all of them um, behind the scenes and in front of the scenes as well. Um, I also want to remind folks, this is the key thing, IBMA for the first year, first time, um, is going to be um, having the opportunity to have the World of Bluegrass award show, the IBMA award show um, on Circle TV. That is a huge, 75 years in uh, with bluegrass music, they get to celebrate come Monday where the 2020 uh, virtual awards will be aired on circle network so check out your local listings for all of that and also announced today uh, or late yesterday ricky skaggs being the recipient of the presidential medal of arts um, from president trump so congratulations to our wonderful bluegrass hall of famer our country hall of famer ricky skaggs in that recipient of an award so again a lot of great things um, to watch with bluegrass check out ibma.org become a member if you're not a member and be sure to follow ibma on social media always keeping us up to date and of course get ready for 2021 world of bluegrass week come in september of 2021 it's gonna be a lot of great fun thank you again echo valley for being here everybody it's been fun it's been great we got real here on real talk bluegrass <laughs> you have yourself a great day I will be on the Smoke Country Jam tomorrow from 10 to 2 on WOBL. You can catch the Bluegrass Borderline Sunday afternoon at noon with me, Michelle Lee, with all the best mix in Bluegrass and your Bluegrass Hall of Famers. You have yourself a wonderful evening. Episode 2 of Echo, uh, Season 2, Episode 2, will be coming at you January 28th. We're going to be welcoming Grammy Award nominee Rick Lang and fellow songwriter, uh, Troy Engel, two amazing songwriters in the industry. Looking forward to having them on. Again, thank you, everybody. All right. Until Thanks next for time. Us. Thank, you. Us. Right, thank you. All right, you, you too. too. <laughs>